want to take a few minutes to talk about the um, debate with uh, Carl Albert. So there were some comments on his Facebook page that I wanted to address because I thought uh, they needed to be addressed. Now, one of the concerns that was raised by the comments on Facebook was that, hey, um, this guy spoke too fast. Well, when you're in a debate situation and you got a time frame and a lot of things are being thrown out, you have to make some decisions in terms of what you want to get in and what you can get in. And when you come prepared with you know, plenty of material, then you want to get as much in as you possibly can to make your case. Well, that means that at some point you might want to speak a little faster. And so I spoke at a more rapid pace than uh, Mr. Uh, Albert did. And if you are going to stay in the affirmative and not chase rabbits and every negative argument that somebody brings up, then you know, you've got to move at that pace. And if you need to touch on a couple of arguments, do that while you're in the affirmative, but then get back to your affirmative material. And so that's one of the things that you know, took place during that discussion. Um, when you're in the affirmative, you make affirmative speeches, and then you go back and you do something relative to uh, these negative responses. But you got to make some choices, and that's pretty much it. You got to make sure that you're covering the salient points as much as possible. And um, I don't think anyone that I've talked to who expressed the fact that uh, they had a difficult time hearing or understanding what I was saying. Uh, the only reason I can see that they didn't understand is that they were totally uninformed on the subject. Now, Mr. Albert is the one who requested the debate. He's set the time and um, suggested that the debate should take place. I merely accepted that, accepted the time frame that he set. And uh, not once did he indicate that he was unaware of the subject matter. Uh, he didn't indicate that before the debate, during the debate, or after the debate. And so none of it caused him to refuse to debate as well. Also, it's not a sin to be prepared for a debate. You know, it was suggested that my speech might have been in the box or something like that. Well, <laughs> um, if you know what a person is going to say, then why not prepare for it so that you don't have to worry about trying to scramble and put together arguments on the spot? Uh, Mr. Albert had spoke the first night, as a matter, well, before, even before then, I look, listened to his presentation that we had together. I went to his website. I checked out other presentations or debates that treated on the topic from his point of view and uh, got as much information as I could on that. Also, I had information out there from a speech on Debate Talk for You as well as the speech I had with Mr. Albert that caused him to challenge me to the debate and uh, went to research his website and I had exchanges with people from his point of view that continued to ask me tons of questions to which I responded all in writing. So all of that information was there. Uh, so it was not my fault that either he didn't prepare well or that I did prepare, and he even said in his first night of his speech that he was going to present the same information the next night, so why would I not be prepared for that? It just makes sense, and it's not a sin to prepare for your debate and to understand what your opponent is going to say. Now, it was said that the reason I spoke at such a rapid pace was because I was nervous. <laughs> well, ironically, Mr. Albert, who spoke at a slower pace, said he was nervous and he didn't even understand why he was nervous. So nervousness is not something that uh, coincides with rapid rate of speech. Um, sometimes people who are very confident speak rapidly because they know what they're talking about. Uh, and people who don't may stammer and stutter and speak a little bit more slowly. Uh, and, and therefore express their nervousness. But, you know, that was beside the point. It had nothing to do with the rate of speech. The, what determined the rate of speech was the choices that had to be made and the time frame in which uh, the debate was uh, being taken. So that's the way that went. Now, there were some post-debate accusations. Uh, this gentleman, Mr. Reuters, uh, on Carl Albert's Facebook page, 
made the statement that I didn't quite understand Matthew 16, 27 and 28, or uh, Matthew 17, 1 through 5, the transfiguration scene, or 2 Peter 1, 16. I thought that was rather interesting. Now, I have made that argument more than once in several presentations. I talked about it on, um, uh, in, in my affirmative speeches, and um, when Mr. Albert finally brought it up, I think after I had you know, pressed him on it again, um, I had 10 minutes left to speak in the debate, and I had to decide which of his arguments that he had made several times that I didn't have time to cover before that I needed to address. And I decided on those, and because I'd already made my point on Matthew 16, 27, and 28, and I didn't think he made his point on it, then I let that one slide. But I'm going to take some time now and go ahead and address it. So if um, my memory serves me correctly, I think that what he said concerning Matthew 16, um, 27 and 28, and you can find that on about 1.59 to 2.44 on the uh, actual debate, if you want to go back and look at it, and that would be the last debate. But in that section, uh, he basically said they witnessed these things happening in the Mount of Transfiguration. They were transfigured into the future and saw what was happening in the future. They saw it happen in a vision saying that we were eyewitnesses. Now that's pretty much the essence of his statement, almost verbatim, but maybe not exact. But that is the essence of what he argued. Now, if you're satisfied with that answer, and particularly Mr. Reuters, if you're satisfied with that answer, uh, it lacks some very important facts about the two cases, and I want to talk about those. Uh, first of all, you're dealing with the difference between a vision and a public announcement. One text, Matthew 16, 27, and 28, was made in a public setting with not only the apostles or Jesus' disciples, but with the people or the multitude, because he spoke that in Caesarea Philippi. And um, whereas on the vision, that was a private matter. That was only spoken to Peter, James, and John. And the only other two people there were, was Moses and Elijah, who appeared in the vision and in the voice of God, along with Jesus himself. Those were the only ones. And at the end of that, he said, tell no man the vision. Well, here is Jesus in the Mount of Transfiguration meeting with a few private individuals, saying, tell no man the vision. And in Matthew 16, 27 and 28, here he is telling all the people, as well as his disciples, about that text. That tells you that they're not the same in terms of the time they were uttered, and that there was a six-day lapse between them. So one is public, open to the public, public invited and present, if you look at Mark 8.34, and the other is private to three disciples and then two people from the past who showed up along with Christ and the Father whose voice was heard when they were in the mount. Now, so that being the case, we got a difference in time, six days earlier for one event, public. We got six days later for the other event and private. Now, with that being the case, the question is, what exactly was said? Now, if Mr. Albert is arguing that what they said was a vision, and that vision was the vision of the parousia, because that's exactly what 2 Peter 1 and verse 16 makes of it, and that's exactly what we say that it is. Peter saw a vision of the parousia, and the parousia was future when they saw it in the Mount of Transfiguration. It was future when it was mentioned in Matthew 16, 1, uh, 16, 27, and 28. And it was future when Peter mentioned it in 2 Peter 1, 16. So it was still future in all of those texts. But here's the thing. Since 2 Peter, this is another domino effect argument, okay? If, 16, if 2 Peter 1, 16 talks about the coming of the Lord, the parousia, and 
the transfiguration in Matthew 17, 1 through 13 was a vision of the parousia. And then Matthew 16, 1 through, uh, 27 through 28 is the actual teaching to the public concerning the parousia. Then they all teach the same thing. So wherever one of them goes, every other text goes. That's the domino effect. Well, what does the text say in Matthew 16, 27, and 28? Because that has to be what's being said about the parousia in Matthew 17, 1 through 5. And if you really understand it, you will see that because the passing of Moses and Elijah, when they passed away, that was indicative of the passing of the law and the prophets. And that's when all things were fulfilled. Luke 21, verses 20 through 22, when Jerusalem was destroyed, surrounded by the Roman armies. He says, these are the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Well, that's what the passing of Moses and Elijah signified, which left Christ alone as the authority, the passing of the law and the prophets, and you know Moses representing the law, Elijah representing the prophets, where Christ is left as the authority. That was the parousia. Peter said that's what he saw. However, in Matthew 16, 1, uh, 27 through 28, he explains it this way. For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his holy angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. There are some standing here, he says, assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And Mark 9, 1 says, till they have seen the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, here's the question. How many apostles died between the six days in the public event in Matthew 16, 27, and 28 and the transfiguration? There is no recorded statement in the Bible that any apostle died between that event. So the second coming certainly could not have happened in the transfiguration because that was the vision of it. How many of the people who were at the public event, as Jesus called the people to him with his disciples, Mark 8, 34, how many of those people are recorded as having died between that six days and the transfiguration? Not a single one of them. So Matthew 16, 27 and 28 could not have been fulfilled in or at the time of the transfiguration six days later because no one was recorded as having died. Now, Jesus hadn't even been crucified. So how could the second coming have occurred at the time of the transfiguration? Well, Mr. Abbott didn't say that it did. If that what he was if he was indicating that Matthew 16, 27 happened at the time of the vision, then he's got a problem with that because he takes the parousia and pushes it way off into the future, even beyond 70 AD. That means whatever they saw in the, according to his doctrine, whatever they saw in the Mount of Transfiguration is something that is still future to us today. I don't buy it because he said there are some standing here who will not taste death. He, even, he didn't say all standing here would not die, nor did he say all would die before the event take place. So if we're going to read it correctly, and if we're going to apply it correctly, it had to happen before some in that generation who was living then died. Well, that takes you right back to Matthew 24, 34, assured I say to you, this generation will in no wise pass away till all these things take place. And so we have an event that is a public event six days before, a private event six days after, but a statement in the public event that speaks of the same thing the private event says, and that's what Second Peter confirms, well, if they all speak of the same thing, then they all speak of the fact that Jesus would come in the glory of his Father with his holy angels to reward every man according to his work that there were some who were standing in his presence who will, would not die till they had seen the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And so we have the two events. You've got to deal with the two events. And when we say that they were two events, 
then that means that the vision is separate from the fulfillment of the vision. The vision is separate from the fulfillment. Just like when John received the uh, apocalypse vision in the Isle of Patmos. Well, when he received the vision, that was not the fulfillment of it. Again, Mr. Albert argues that the fulfillment of Revelation is still off in the future. So the vision of it certainly couldn't be the fulfillment of it. And therefore, the vision of the parousia, which is Matthew 16, 27, and 28, could not be the fulfillment of Matthew 16, 27, and 28. Now, that vision, therefore, teaches eminence, just like all the rest of the New Testament does, on the return of Christ. It teaches that it was at hand. As a matter of fact, Matthew 16, 27 says, For the Son of Man is about to come in the glory of his Father. He uses the word mellow there, which is a word that means eminent. It's, it's equivalent to at hand in uh, such texts. Now, is he going to refuse to acknowledge that evidence and persist in that view? Well, that's going to be his choice, but it certainly indicates that I'm well aware of what the text teaches. Now, why did I raise the point, or why, why did Mr. Reuters, rather, raise the point? I think he raised it because it demonstrated that he felt Mr. Albert had not done a sufficient job in the debate. Of course, that's been the consensus from everybody I talked to that has watched it. And so, because he felt that his man didn't live up to the challenge of the debate, he wanted to raise his credibility and make an excuse for him while at the same time challenging my credibility and my honesty in the discussion, claiming that I didn't understand Matthew 16, 27, and 28. Well, if he takes the position that Mr. Albert did, it seems that Mr. Reuters doesn't un understand uh, Matthew 16, 27, and 28, nor the Transfiguration or 2 Peter 1, 16. Now, once you listen to what I just covered with you, you might understand why I spoke at a much more rapid pace during the discussion because it takes time to get into the details and explain some of these things. And so once the argument was made, I've made it several times, I felt that it stood and that it was not adequately addressed. And even if he had adequately addressed it, I still may have chosen not to revisit it again, simply because I wanted to get some other things in that had not been addressed. And that's the reason I spoke at a fast pace, but I don't even need to explain that. It's just the way it is. Now, after having done that, will it help Mr. Albert's case? Even now that I'm speaking much more slowly, will it help Mr. Albert's case? No, it's not going to help his case. My point is the same as it was in the debate, and it just makes it more uh, devastating to his point because he couldn't establish it then and he can't establish it now. Then we have this charge of craftiness by Mr. Reuters that I was attempting to be crafty. Well, if that was the case, why would I give my opponent a scripture that he was looking for to save him time so that he would have more time to make his argument? I was interested in him making the argument because if he makes the argument, then I have a chance to refute it, which I did. This is on the time that I gave him the passage of scripture on 2 Peter 3 and verse 8. Even when I gave him the, the wrong scripture, it was the, right, the next verse, he said, oh, that's a good scripture too, and that helped him. So both of the scriptures that I gave him helped him to make the argument that he was making. And then I just came back and refuted it. But what was his comment about it? It was different from Mr. Reuter's comment. Mr. Albert said, I was a gracious opponent to give him the scripture. Let me tell you what happened the night before between uh, myself, Laron Campbell, and Mr. Albert. We were discussing some things. Mr. Campbell had asked me some questions, and I was giving him responses. And Mr. Campbell said, you might want to hold that information uh, because you're giving him your information that he can use against you in the debate. I said, it doesn't matter. I, I'm confident 
in the information that I have. So if he can refute it, then he should. But you know what? He didn't refute it. He didn't refute any of the information that we discussed in the post-debate, uh, you know, after the debate that we had our conversation on the first night, on Saturday night. So I wasn't trying to hide anything. If, if what you're saying is true, put it out there. Let it, let it stand. It can stand the test whether you say it in the debate or whether you say it out of the debate. He could have refuted it that night or he could have refuted it in the debate. He had that opportunity and it didn't happen. So I wasn't trying to be crafty. I was even willing to let them have my material before uh, they got up to, or before he got up to discuss it. And then lastly, we signed an agreement for the speeches, for the time, for when the debate was going to occur and what the format of the debate was going to be. And then after the debate, uh, Mr. Albert and his friend wanted a Q&A session. Well, that was not according to the rules. That was not according to what we signed as the contractual obligation for the debate. Now, I granted it, but even some people in the audience didn't want to have the Q&A. They didn't feel they needed to ask Mr. Albert anything at that point, nor myself. But I granted it because, you know, they were guests and we, we did it. But even then, what good did it do in terms of changing the outcome of the discussion? It didn't change the outcome. And I would have been well within my contractual obligations, to which I agreed, to which we both agreed, if I had said no. And some people in the audience did say no to having uh, the Q&A session. And then lastly, there was this point of order that was called about me introducing some new material in the last speech. Mr. Albert had made an argument on the temple being built, this physical temple that had to be rebuilt. I was responding to his argument. His argument was that a physical temple made by hands was going to be built in Jerusalem at some point in the future. My argument was the spiritual temple was being built during the pre parousia reign of Christ and it was consummated at his return. It was a house not made with hands because the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. I made that point in my first conversation with Mr. Albert and I made it in the debate. And I have referred to it and alluded to it several times during the debate. So there was no issue for a point of order. It was invalid. But it's out there on his um, Google Hangout, and we'll leave it out there because it still doesn't change the debate, and I was well within the protocol of the debate to address the argument that he made in the debate. Now, if I had started off on another one of my uh, affirmative speeches, which you know covered one topic that I didn't cover, that would have been new material, but to respond to his argument was not. And so from that point, and even Mr. Campbell agreed. Uh, Laron said, no, he was responding to your point. You made an argument on the temple as physical. His argument was it was spiritual. He responded that was in order. So his own uh, man told him that uh, what I said and what I did was appropriate uh, for the discussion. But to put it out there like that makes it kind of uh, taint what happened as though, you know, I pulled some underhanded uh, trick and, and I did not. And so his protest was invalid, but, you know, it stands out there and we're going to let it stand. So that's the crux of the matter. So to Mr. Reuters, who had the concerns about whether or not I knew what I was talking about on Matthew 16, 27 and 28, 2 Peter 1, 16 and the transfiguration, I hope that you can understand now. And I hope you can understand why I spoke rapidly. I hope you can understand why Mr. Albert disagreed with you and said that I was a gracious opponent as opposed to one trying to be crafty. And therefore, it makes the comments that you made suspect. So I think, you know, what we do is let the debate stand as it is and um, just move on from this point um, and not try to... Um, you know, cast a reflection in any way, but I thought it was necessary to answer that. And there are probably other points that I may answer in video, and that's what Mr. Albert said he was going to do as well. He was going to bring up some things 
Uh, and I think Mr. LaRon said he would do some of the same. So let them present their information. If they put it out there, I assure you, I'm going to respond to it and, uh, and deal with it. With that, I want to thank you for watching this video. Visit our website at www.allthingsfulfilled.com. Visit our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash allthingsfulfilled.com. And uh, you can visit us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash allthingsfulfilled.com. I'm William Bell. Peace out, and I'll talk to you soon.